Hello everybody, my name is Mary Guinan Darmody of Tipperary Studies and I'm out and about in Thurlis with Jimmy Duggan who is going to show us some of the unusual features and some of the unusual stories attached to the town. Today we're in the centre of town. Mary, I've been running up through this town since I was a boy and that's not today, nor yesterday. Um, what, first of all, in my opinion, biased of course, it is the finest commercial space in Munster. It's a perfect size, very well laid out, but what amazes me is that one of the original Burgesses of Thurlis, people who set up the town and laid out the town in perches or a fraction of a perch, and gave to each of the people they had invited in the great folk wandering of the Middle Ages to come to Thurlis, they gave them a section of the market town. They built a house at right angles to the, to, to the square, and therefore you have to go down a lane, and a small kitchen garden. So you're saying, Jimmy, it didn't evolve kind of naturally, it was planned? Oh yeah, very, very, very much so, because in early Gaelic Ireland there was no Thurlis, and, and if we look at the place names, it really was a bit of a swamp. Uh, around the river, you have Mona Dreen and Mona Kiba and Mona Kaka and so on. After the bridge, there was a raised area. Some some people think that that's what Durlis means, actually. Uh, not so much a strong fort as a raised area through boggy land, which was very important for communication. And around that raised area, they built Thurlis. Because Mona is bog. Mona is bog, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and they laid it out, as I said, in perches or fractions of a perch, and they gave a section of the town to each of the people they had invited. And there was Thomas the Frenchman, there was James the Welshman, there was Simon the Cleric, there was Thomas the Archer, uh, Grimaldi de Samsbury, Grimaldi from Samsbury. These were the original Burgesses, the people who found the Thurlis, under the butler, of course, on the ages of the butler family. None of those are local names. No, none of them are local names. Uh, well, Russell Tobin, the, those names have lasted. But no, it was very much uh, people that were brought in and given this given this area. Of course, the native O'Briens didn't think much of that, but um, and, and made their feelings felt in, in some tremendous battles, one of which we've discussed, dis discussed already. Uh, but eventually, the Norman conquest won, and and the town then was laid, was laid out. And as I said, the amazing thing is that we could look at it today, and it's exactly the same. Because the in the centre was 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 the market, and that developed then into the market house, of course, which was behind the stone man uh, up to 1900. We can see all the properties, especially on the money side. Did you know that, Mary, that one side of the square is the money side? No. And the other the sunny side. Okay, can I figure it out? Mm. I don't think you can because no. the sunny side is quite the money side again today. So the market house, which is which is exactly the same as the market house in Temple Moor with the arches underneath for, for the market, there was a shambles and so on. And uh, off the off the square, then you have where all the people lived, and they only lived around the square for centuries. So was it very congested? Very much so. Population somewhere around the famine, somewhere like we have today, just seven, seven and a half thousand, all living in alleyways. But of course, alleyways. And with very at little, right angles to the square. Yeah, and very little facilities. And very little facilities. But of course one of the most interesting alleyways is where the great entrepreneur, the Charlie Cooney as he was known around Thurlis, Carlo Bianconi, uh, came, his father sent him to Ireland to, to uh, sell holy pictures and mirrors. And uh, obviously he had to walk everywhere from town to town. So. 
um, the journey to Clanmel will be one day, stay overnight and back in. Sitting on the moat in our mail, he got the bright idea that this had to stop. There must be a better way of getting from place to place for the ordinary everyday person. Of course there was horse, horses, but the penal law said that even if a Catholic had a horse, he, you had a right to buy it from him for five pounds. So the Napoleonic Wars were just over. Europe was full of horses that had been bred to draw cannon through muddy battlefields. And uh, Bianconi set up his first carriage journey from Caer to Clanmel and his second carriage journey from Thurlis to Clanmel. So we are looking here, uh, Jimmy, mm -hmm. then, at the building that he used as his office. Well, more, more, more than his office, he used, he used it as his stables. Um, he had a stable every eight miles because that's as far as four horses can draw a carriage with eight people uh, or more on it uh, at speed. And the drivers had a bugle and they shouted, get out of my way, fog a balloch, as they whipped the horses along the roads of Tipperary. Road rage, 19th Road century rage, side. 19th century. You know, we only have to close our eyes here in, in, in the lane to hear the clip-clop of the, the carriage um, coming in. The, the hayloft, of course, was up on top, lovely wooden floor, and then you can see in the arches where the, the carriage uh, the carriage is pulled in. Again, you see the brick and stone. Mary, Beautiful the, yeah, building. Yes, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, later on, of course, uh, where we're standing now was actually the centre of revolutionary thoroughness in the 1920s. Um, at the end, the other end of this lane is Mixie Connell's pub, where Covenant Jimmy Lahey was a barman. Uh, on the right of the lane, gone now, um, is the house of Larry Hickey, assassinated by the murder squad. Uh, Bridie Fitzpatrick was just down the road, at Bertie Connington's, uh, where they hung out the flag for Kitten's funeral. Um, and where a brother of Thomas McDonough was lodging at the time of the 1916 Rising, and it was uh, May Cantwell that went to, to Dublin uh, to find out what was happening in 1916. He, 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 was, uh, he, he didn't go in case he would have been captured. And so all this is happening around the town, um, and, but the fabric of the town rem rem remains exactly the same from the original Norman and there are still problems with title and, and all that sort of thing when something comes to be sold in, in, in Thurlis because the title goes back uh, goes such so a long far. way. The small narrow plots going back to a supposedly town wall. We think maybe it may have been just an earthen wall. They certainly took the tax to build the walls around Thurlis, but whether they ever built them or not is another story. And then in the great era of the landlords and the Georgian era, uh, Thurlis is without Georgian buildings except for the Archbishop's Palace because the Matthew family, the Earl of Landaff, uh, who owned Thurlis, left Thurlis and went and built a, a beautiful mansion in Thomastown just outside oh, Golden. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. It's in ruins, but it is yes. beautiful. Yes, but that should have been the big house of Thurlis, if you like. Every laneway kind of has a story. This is the most feared laneway in Thurlis and during the famine times because this is the house of the agent, John Cairn, the agent of the Matthew estate. And he decides in 1849 that he would be better off with cattle rather than people on the land. And so in that office, he, he writes in one quarter, in the quarter sessions of Thurlis Court, around towards the end of the 1840s, he writes 900 ejectment orders. And so the town is full of the sounds of emergency men and RIC and uh, soldiers and marching out in the morning uh, and levelling houses, as they did, for instance, in the village of Farnry, where 200 people were left homeless on one morning. They had to come in and and make their way to the workhouse. So Remind me, Jimmy, where's Farnry? Farnry is a mile out, out the Bourne Road, on the right. Nothing there today. 
that's the story of Landau yeah. Lodge. Yeah. Then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose finally then the stone man, you know, uh, the market house is long gone. The stone man, the pockets of a great coats filled with barley, no kitchen on the run, no striking camp. We, as Seamus said, of 1798, it's a bit of a laugh really to have a, a, a stone man in the centre of Thurles commemorating 1798 because when the Wexford people wanted us to rise out, we didn't. But one of the reasons why Thurles was so quiet during the 1798 rebellion was the work of a man, the High Sheriff of Tipperary, Flogger Fitzgerald, and there are records of him, you know, flogging people from one end of the town to the, to the West Gate. Oh, his reputation, yes. yeah, is, is, is really bad. So when it was unveiled, of course, in 1900, it was a time of great kind of revolutionary fervour. The GA had been founded and the Celtic twilight, the workers, everything was coming together. In it. You can see from the photos of that day, the excitement of people in the windows all around the square looking, out, looking around becomes then the centre of any kind of commemoration during the revolutionary period. So the death of Thomas Ashe, for instance, you know, yes. hundreds and hundreds walk silently down a darkened town, gather around, they gather around the stone man and the rosary is recited. So even though it was a 1798 monument, it really covered an awful lot more than just 1798. Yes, it became it became a symbol, a symbol yeah. of, 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 of like of revolution, revolution or yes. yeah, Very the struggle so. for nationalism yes. or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. For me, anyway, the whole enriching thing about the square in Thurles is still maintains um, the original Norman idea of a market town. Town, and. That's even when I was growing up, we yeah. always called Thurlet a market yeah. town. Yeah, and you probably remember the markets in the big, in the, in, yeah. the Saturday markets. Yes, 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 the Saturday on markets the in the square. I remember my father buying coats there, and they would be, you know, there were markets, there weren't always new coats. No, no. But no, there were, people we were damn like, glad yeah, to get yeah. them. Yeah. And plenty of cabbage plants and, and the fairs, of course, were in Thurlet at yeah. the time. Yeah. And Jimmy, thanks for this view around the square. Uh, we will take another trip another day. Yeah.